Hey guys, welcome to the Higher Points, and today we're coming at you with a to the point episode. Just me and Nick here in the studio, just gonna bounce some ideas back and forth, things we've been thinking about um, here and there, what we've been uh, working on. Um, it's just a little bit different of a pace compared to our normal interviews with guests. So um, Nick's gonna start us off with uh, what he's been thinking about. So let's hear Nick. Yeah, well, first of all, bear with me because I don't feel well. So if I start hacking in the middle of this, you know, I can just imagine Felicia as she's sitting here listening to the podcast and I'm like, you know, and she's like in her office, like, oh God, oh God, turn this down. He's got COVID. <coughs> He's got COVID. Yeah. Yep. Spreading COVID all over Sterling again. Yeah. Going into lockdown. All get those, your hey, masks hey, ready, hey, everybody. Hey, all those vaccinated people, this shouldn't be happening. I don't get it. So, you know, that was supposed to be the end all be all save all. Sure was. You know, two weeks that turned into three years. So anyway, uh, <laughs> um, so I basically, so I've been reading a, a book called Challenging the Law Enforcement Organization. And it got me thinking. And, and even though this book is about like the law enforcement organization, it can really apply to any business environment. And it has been absolutely spot on on everything that I've experienced in my law enforcement career. So it kind of leads off with basically just talking about a little bit of the human behavior. So the book is by a gentleman by the name of Jack Enter, and he's a PhD and he kind of like has worked in law enforcement organizations, but he also does training and all this other kind of stuff. We starts talking about the, essentially the human condition of why, why is it that your boss does what they do? And it was interesting because he didn't have like some magical formula like they grew up and they were in a, a, t- a tattered household and, you know, they learned this way. Well, it's like, think of anything that you do in your life. If you're not intentional about what you do, like for instance, if you're not intentional about scheduling time for the gym, you're not going to go. If you aren't intentional about scheduling date nights with your wife or whatever, you're not going to go. You're mm-hmm. not going to do those things. It's easy to come home, Fall chill out, it. relax, and become lazy, essentially. Complacent. And, and and not that I'm saying that coming home and relaxing is a bad thing, but I'm just trying to illustrate the point. And so he says that managers basically do the same thing. They have all these great intentions. They know what it means to be a leader. They've had poor leaders. They've had good leaders. Mm-hmm. But when they get into that job, it's just easier to kind of sit back and be lazy and just kind of put the fires out as they come to you. Yep. So he illustrates in his book that there are three different types of employees. You have exemplary employees, reactive employees, and problem employees. So exemplary, obviously, being in the top, uh, reactive, essentially being your middle ground employees, and then problem employees, which we, we all know that. We've all dealt with those. And... So it was interesting because he talks about how, obviously, we all know what the exemplary employee is, right? They come, they show up, they they produce, they are reliable, and they aren't they don't do they don't cause problems. They're your exemplary, amazing employee, and they're about they bring everybody else up. Yeah, they're about ten percent of your 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 organization. Mm -hmm. And again, keep in mind this is any organization, not just law enforcement. Then you have your reactive employees, and they're the ones that are kind of like in the middle. You know, they, they come in, they do their job, they do a pretty decent job. They don't really cause a whole lot of problems. Like you might have some disciplinary issues, things like that, things that you might need to work with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they are watching the exemplary employees as well as the problem employees because they aren't really speaking up or they really aren't putting themselves out there. They're just kind of falling. There. Yeah. They're just kind of there and they're getting their eight hours. Yep. And, uh, and they represent 80% of your organization and 10% of your organization is problem employees. And I don't have to explain them. Everybody knows what that means. Yeah. So, answers. So it was interesting. He said the group that you should actually be focused the most on um, are like the marginal behaviors. So like, for instance, uh, just people that maybe aren't quite showing up, aren't quite doing a good job, or especially the problem employees and the exemplary employees is like the ones you should focus on. He said because the reactive employees, he says they can go either way. And keep in mind, they represent 80% of your organization. Mm-hmm. So they can either be exemplary or they can be a problem based on how you manage. So, for instance, exemplary employees, since they are known to be the reliable, the show up, the, you know, do handle business, um, the reactive employees are watching and they see those exemplary employees. They're getting more work, more workload, more things to do, but not extra pay, not extra time, not extra anything. So the reactive employee thinks to themselves, why am I going to be an exemplary employee? Why? I see them being overworked and we make the same pay. Like, mm-hmm. why, why do I need to be an exemplary employee? This makes no sense. 
Whereas the flip side of the coin is if they see you not handling problem employees, that's going to destroy their morale. You know, they're going to say like this person keeps getting rid of it. Not to mention like, let's say, you know, Nate, you mishandle some telephone policy or whatever Mm -hmm. and make long distance calls. The way that most organizations handle that is to make this blanket policy where now everybody has to fill out this form or whatever, right? Instead of handling the problem with the problem employee. Mm -hmm. And you absolutely destroy morale when you do stuff like that. Yeah. And like, instead of pulling that one employee aside and just having your one-on-one conversation, you address it all together in one meeting. You don't say who did this, but you like... You don't single this person out, but you preach to the whole choir, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, so it's your job to handle the business with that person. So, mm-hmm. like, for instance, if you want to do that, handle it with the person that's the problem, yeah. right? If you want to do this form or whatever, like, if you were the one violating that policy, I'd have you fill out the form telling me what your calls were and what they were for, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and so it was interesting to me because I'd never thought of it through that lens of, like, as a manager and your your dick your 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 uh what I want to say delegating you know responsibilities obviously it's you want to give it to your exemplary employee right because you want to, you want the stuff to be done you want it to be done well you want it to be done right but that's actually kind of counterintuitive a you're going to burn out your exemplary, exemplary employee mm-hmm. and then b the reactive employee again sees that there's no reason to be exemplary because they're getting all the work and they're getting overworked and underpaid so, you know, giving some to them. And then another thing I never really considered was he talked about actually it was better to promote in your organization from the reactive employees and not from the exemplary employees. He's not, he's saying now, now exemplary employees with proper mentorship can be good supervisors. Mm-hmm. But the way he ex, or the way he illustrated the point was, your exemplary employee, they show up, they do work, they like solve problems, they get shit done, right? Mm-hmm. Well, when they start supervising reactive and problem employees, they get angry. Why aren't you like me? Yep. Why aren't you doing what I do? Why is this so hard? And so they don't manage as effectively. And I was like, huh. Whereas they say if you give them proper mentorship, you can help that exemplary employee kind of have a little more empathy. Yeah. Whereas they said the reactive employees. That's one thing I'm trying to really uh, work on is like thinking through their shoes, you know, because yeah. I'm the same way. Like I want, like these guys need to know exactly what needs to be done and like my way and in my head. And I know like they don't think the way I do. They don't have the experiences that I've had, you know, I'm trying to be empathetic and figure out how to best manage people and not get angry in that way. Cause it is fr- like, I do get frustrated from that. Yeah. Well, and, and he talked about how reactive employees are your best to actually pr- promote from because they have spent their time in that reactive state watching both sides. Mm-hmm. Okay. And they have been sometimes treated poorly or unfairly or whatever because they're watching the problem employee get away with things and all this other kind of stuff. So they know what it's like to be in that situation. So they're a little more empathetic. Yeah. And I was just like, damn, like I never thought about that. You know, I never thought of it from that that standpoint. And so um, he was also talking about how problem employees, they're, how you know a problem employee, like everybody knows, like it's pretty easy. But he says, typically, if you ask your problem employee what the sick policy is, they can tell you policy number 123A says that after three consecutive days, you have to get a doctor's note and then blah, you know, because they constantly are they're pushing those lines, pushing those lines yep. and testing those limits because they're a problem employee. And he's like, whereas if you went to an exemplary employee and asked them the same thing, they'd say, I, I have no idea mm-hmm. because they don't take sick time. And so it's, it's interesting of just kind of being able to recognize the differences between the two. And, um, you know, he talked about how if you handle those problems, those, those problems like with sick time and all that other kind of stuff, he says rather than the problem employee might be a problem once or twice a month instead of, you know, once or twice a week to just make sure that you're standing on top of those things. And that the biggest one of the biggest takeaways that I got from the book was essentially you just have to do the right thing and you're typically not going to get a pat on the back good job as a leader when you do the right thing or you do the tough thing, like when you write somebody up. Mm-hmm. And he says even if what you did gets overturned 
by like HR or a grievance process or whatever, most people don't like that confrontation. Same thing. Leaders don't like confrontation either. So they typically won't handle problem employees because they don't want that confrontation. Um, but most of the time you can correct the behavior just by sitting down and having that confrontation and having that write up, even though it may have gotten overturned and all this other kind of stuff, they still know that you're going to hold that standard mm -hmm. and they're going to have change behavior based on that because they don't want to have that confrontation with you. They don't want to have that at all. You know, yeah, I understand that completely. It's, I don't know. I feel like it's a, it's a case by case deal too, though, because you got to manage everybody in their own separate ways too. Yeah. Like, I mean, not everybody's going to learn the same way, I guess. Well, that's what you and I were talking about with like that disc assessment. Yeah. Um, and if you don't know what a disc assessment is, it's basically kind of like a personality test in a way. It's obviously much more in depth than that, but it's, uh, <coughs> I mean, just based on where you're at on that, mm -hmm. you know, you might be somebody that, you know, is essentially an extrovert or an introvert or a people person or, you know, like a dominant person. Yeah. And so it just kind of helps you as a manager be able to more effectively yeah. manage and talk to people and stuff like that. Knowing where your employees are at on that scale helps, you know. Yeah. Um, but And was, you can read that. I mean, you can, you don't have to have them take this assessment. You can read who, like, where they fit in that. You know, I mean, I think it would be, like for me, the best things you can do would be like disc assessments as well as mo emotional intelligence assessments. Mm -hmm. Because it's it's easy, and, and I think the best quality that any good leader has is emotional intelligence. Like the last training that I just went to, you know, the instructor put these things up on the board, and I've already told this to Nate. One of the questions was, like, a, a detention officer took $100 out of an inmate's property while booking them in. And then she asked, why did they do it and how did it make you feel? And then like my question for my group table was a dispatcher ran the criminal history of her daughter's new boyfriend, which in the law enforcement realm is a huge no, no. You cannot run people's criminal history without a specific reason. And you will get audited on this stuff and they will come back and say, why did you run this? Prove it. And if you can't prove it, I think it's like $33,000 fine and jail time. Like that's the maximum or? So that's like, I don't know. That's just what they always tell you. Yeah. But, um, so, so why did you do it? How did it make you feel? So it was interesting because you go around the room to a bunch of cops, right? Like we, we typically are venturing into people's lives because like they're having a great day, right? Like they're fighting or they're drunk or they're hurt. Or something like that. That's typically why we're venturing into the life. So we see the world at its worst constantly. Yep. That's constantly what we're responding to. And so it's easy to develop some cynicism as a result of that. And so, like, for instance, the detention officer scenario, they said, like, why did he do it? And how did it make you feel? And a lot of the answers were abuse of authority, a greedy, worthless and how'd it make you feel like anger, you know, like this guy should be fired, you know, all this other kind of stuff. And then, you know, that was pretty much the whole room. And then she gets around to our table group and I just told her on ours and keep in mind, this is the dispatcher that ran the criminal history of her daughter or daughter's boyfriend. And I said, why did she do it? And I said, out of protection and preservation for her daughter. And how did that make you feel? And I said, understanding. Mm -hmm. And the instructor was like, whoa, like what, 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 like. And then she pr pretty much uh, instructed on that throughout the whole class. Now, she did say, well, what do you mean? And I told her, I said, I understand why she did it <clears throat> because it's her daughter and she wants to make sure her daughter's safe. And so I get it. I, I get where her, her uh, motivations came from. I said, now that doesn't exclude her from, from, the, the, penalty. Consequ from the consequences. Yeah. But I am now making a decision out of... A, a good place mentally instead of from anger. Yep. You know, and I can't tell you how many times I've made poor decisions as a father out of <clears> anger <throat> and had to apologize. It's hard to not, I mean, you've got to be really aware of that emotion you yes. know, and where you're pushing that. And like taking a step back is 99.9% .9 of the time the correct thing to do. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and of course the, the question was loaded, right? I mean, everybody always wants to have more information. And she's mm -hmm. like, you don't get more information, make a decision. 
And so, like, now if we added to that scenario and said her daughter, she ran the criminal history of her daughter's new boyfriend because... Two years ago, she was violently raped and she has gone through suicidal ideations and um, therapy and medications and multiple trips to a psychiatric hospital and she's now better. And she, this is her first time dating since that incident. So Would that not like change it a little bit? No, I mean, emotional understands. Yeah. Emotional intelligence wise, mm-hmm. not, not penalty wise, but emotional intelligence. Like with you, if you had that more information as a supervisor, because let's face it, as a supervisor, you would be helping that mom through that crisis mm-hmm. at work. Because that's going to translate into her work. It is. And so you, you know what's going on. You're also invested in that now. Now you have the emotions invested in it. So, you know, you have to make those decisions from a place of understanding. And that doesn't necessarily mean that she doesn't get written up. That doesn't necessarily mean that she doesn't maybe lose her job. But you're making that decision from a place where you're emotionally intelligent and aware of your feelings and i mean really kind of emotionally detached from the situation you know just trying to think through it clearly without emotion yeah which is hard to do for a lot of people like i struggle with it i think we all do but it's just something to be aware of and try to like really focus on and like hone in on what emotions you're feeling you know yeah and then one of the uh last things that i wanted to talk about which i guess i've kind of dominated this so I'm already 18 minutes in. Sorry about that. No, we're good. I just had something real short I okay. wanted to talk about. Well, so uh, one of the podcasts I also listen to, and I know Nate does as well, is Ryan Mickler's Order of Man. Uh, if you haven't listened to Order of Man, it's great. Orderofman.com, Ryan Mickler. Um, he's also on Instagram, at Ryan Mickler. He put out a podcast on the 4th called Effort Without Expectation. And so basically, he was just talking about um, you know just putting effort into things and setting re- realistic timelines. Like if you want to have this like six-pack abs, you can't set... And you're 100 pounds overweight. You can't set 90 days as your goal, yep. right? So, I mean, unless, of course, you're injecting a bunch of trend, then maybe. But Injected in my um, veins. <laughs> uh, but what I'm getting at is, like, in this podcast, he was talking about essentially, like, that intentionality and, like, that advanced leadership training. They were talking about that intentionality and the journaling and being intentional on things. And in the podcast, he said you have to have the mindset that, like, whatever it is that you set your mind to, it's already done. Like it's already, it's done. It just hasn't manifested yet. Yeah, it's going to happen. I was like, oh man, like that's good stuff. I like that. And basically you're just kind of like checking the boxes in the middle just to essentially just like, okay, it's already done. I'm just checking the boxes to make sure it happens. And it's kind of interesting because now you're working that process instead of worrying about that outcome. And it was kind of an interesting thought process. I've always heard of the, you know, work in the process, not the outcome, that kind of stuff. But it's like, I see people that are truly successful. That's their mindset. Like when they set their mind to it, you're not changing it. And like it, they're going to make it happen. It, it goes like Andy talks about it too. And like meditating on what you want out of your life, you know, from whether you want a drive a Lamborghini when you're 28 years old, or if you want to like have a family and have a solid family by 30 <laughs> or whatnot, you know, like, meditating on that and like taking action for towards those goals you know 100 percent. well and and speaking of the lamborghini thing andy also said that uh he said like if you're if you're gonna be that person that like when you're when you're setting up your goals and your thought process and what you're working towards in your mind have the mindfulness of like i don't just want to buy the base model lamborghini and drive it around you know the base model that quote unquote everyone has He's like, you need to have the mindset that I own the factory that makes the Lamborghinis. Mm -hmm. He's like, that's the mindset you need to have if you want to be successful. And I was like, wow. It's like, that's awesome. That's good stuff. Um, And so, like, that's something that I'm working through and I I shouldn't say necessarily struggling with. Uh, I just find it's easy, like we talked about earlier in the podcast, for me to get lazy, right? Like, for me tonight, what I want to do is... I want to go home, I want to smoke a pipe, and I want to play video games till 3 or 4 in the morning. That's my lazy, comfortable, easy way to do things. But I set myself up for failure the next day Mm -hmm. by doing that because I'm basically going to sleep all day, wake up, go to work. And it's like, okay, now I just basically wasted a day. When there are a bunch of, like, checkbox items of things that I need to be getting done to move myself forward. And I'm telling you, it's going to be a struggle tonight because, I mean, I am going to play some video games, but I will cut myself off. Like, I typically will set a time. Like, here's the time. 
and all right, I got to go and get ready for work yep. or get ready to go do work. So, um, it's just, uh, it's just not falling back into those lazy, easy habits, you know, and not living and getting complacent. It's easy to get complacent. Yeah. And like every day, like there's little things, little, little decisions that you make every day that you don't think about, you know, um, like say like Andy uses as an example, like he, like say he pees with the toilet seat down, you know, he's just going to wipe that off just so later on, like his wife doesn't have to deal with that. Just the little things. And so you don't leave that and get complacent. And yeah, just keep because moving. then that starts to kind of cascade yes. into other things. Mm -hmm. You become lazy in those small things. And eventually it cascades into other things because now you're doing this or that. You're like not putting the clothes in the hamper, whatever. Yeah. And it cascades into those other things that you, now you become like really lazy and complacent. It's the same thing. Like it, putting the, putting the shopping cart away when you're done, you know, putting it in the, in the little stall. In I, the parking a lot. really good example I have of this is from when I played football. Like when we were Sterling college football is good. We all had sharp uniforms there was very few guys that had, like, you had to have your shirts tucked in, matching socks, like, um, it was, like, either gray, blue, or white on your undershirt. Like, all had to be crisp, and then, like, now, and like, we and we won championships. We were, like, every year competing for a KCAC championship, like, one or two games away. Um, and those coaches had a championship caliber mindset. Like, back then, I look at that, I was like, when I was in school, I'm like, this is stupid. You know, I look back now, I'm like, it makes sense, you know. And I go to a Sterling College game now, and I look out there, and it hurts my eyes. Because dudes got their shirts untucked, they got back pads showing, they've got unmatching socks, they're wearing... I mean, the last game I went to was that pink out. We didn't do pink out, because we all wanted to look the same, and like... What's pink out? Like, breast cancer awareness. Uh-huh. So they were in pink socks or oh, okay. sleeves or whatnot. You know? Got it. And just that consistency on the field. Just, I don't know. It just needs to be more consistent, I guess. And it's easy to get complacent and not care about those small things, but it's the little things that win championships. Well, and, uh, you know, I was listening. Or lead to, to success. Yeah, I was listening to Dichotomy of Leadership this morning. I'm listening through it again as I was walking. And. They talk about that same thing of like everybody wants to do the advanced tactics, right? Mm -hmm. Like I want to go out on game day and I want to do this and I want to perform and I want to do all these things. But like if you can't get the basic foundational things like getting your socks right. Making your bed in the morning. Yeah. Uh, oh, fuck. I never make my bed. But um, Well, I mean I'm talking about like those Navy SEAL guys. Like and guys in the military, they make their bed every day in boot camp, you know? Yeah. And – you know, like it's, it's, you, if you don't have a good foundation with which to build on the rest of it, just, it does it comes crumbling down. It's like building your house on sinking sand. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, as a construction worker, would you ever build a house on like really sandy foundation? Nope. I mean, because what's going to happen? Better pack that shit in or it's going to fall apart. Yeah. So it's the same thing about just life and it's not just football. I mean, this can be applied to anything you do. I don't care if you work at McDonald's making French fries. Right? Football is just an easy example yeah, for yeah, me because yeah. it's just like, I mean, that's. Well, but I think it's easy for people that are listening to the podcast to say, well, this doesn't apply to me mm -hmm. because like I don't do football. I don't do this. Like I'm not an athlete. Like I'm not this. I'm not that. You know, I'm not a cop uh, and, and it doesn't matter. I don't care if you're a stay at home mom, you know, if you don't have the consistency in your home with your kids. Don't expect them to grow up and be consistent, good human beings, mm -hmm. etc. Like, I don't care what it is. And that wasn't me taking a pot shot at, like, stay-at-home moms, by the way. But it's just, like, no matter where you're at and what you do, like, that consistency and that that foundational work is what you build, you know, essentially the empire that is your life and that is your experiences mm -hmm. on. So, sounds like a good place to stop. Sound good? Works for me. Cool. Well, we kept you a little bit longer than we normally do. And oh. We appreciate you. Oh, that's right. You did say you wanted to say One something. One more thing. I just yeah. want to remind people to go out and vote this week. Yep. Tuesday, right? Tuesday. Go vote. I don't care who you vote for, but you just need to go out there and vote. It is your civic duty to 
<laughs> it's a great country that you live in to go vote for your representatives. And it's it's an important election or an important election. So do your research too. Yep. Yeah. I agree with that. Uh, I plan on doing the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. So sorry for taking away your limelight there. <laughs> no, you're good. I just uh just wanted to put that little reminder in there. So All right. Well, everybody, thanks for taking the time to listen to the podcast. Again, we're truly humbled that you take your time to be here with us. Uh, Just give us some ratings and reviews on whatever platform it is that you're listening on. We greatly appreciate it. Um, Check us out, www.thehigherpoints.com, on Facebook, at The Higher Points Podcast, on Instagram, at The Higher Points. We'll catch up with you next time, next week, and we will uh, uh, just wanted to let everybody know, again, that we are still renting out the podcast studio if you wanted to come in and make a couple podcasts or get an idea of what the equipment looks like or anything like that, just uh, reach out to us. There's a contact page on our website and you can get in contact with us. We appreciate you. We'll catch up with you guys next time. Bye guys.